So we're going to take uh, the long view, I'll see if I can get this thing to work, on how we've got to where we are with crops today. So I'm going to be talking a bit about ancient DNA, but I'm not just an ancient DNA freak. We use um, computational models, historical DNA, and something in the stuff that I'm going to show you today that borders on plant science, so I hope that'll um, feel comfy for you. So this is the mother of all maps, um, and it obviously it shows the world. It shows the world 8,000 years ago. So I shall try and point up these bright green areas are where the, the land was going to in those times. So during the last uh, 10,000 years, in fact, it's been going on for the last 16,000 years, the sea levels have been rising, which actually connects to, to a point that was made in the previous talk. If you want to uh, increase your productivity, you want more land to grow stuff on, and uh, really what you wanted is an ice age right now. So from the North Sea, Things like this have been pulled up by fishermen for the past 100 years or so. So you'll probably recognize that chap there as a mammoth. We have a rock, um, horns, uh, even human bones have been pulled up from the, from the North Sea. And that's because basically it was all land around about 16,000 years ago and right up to around the beginning of the Neolithic, so the beginning of the arrival uh, of agriculture into, into Northwest Europe. So this area that we know as Dogger Bank today um, where we're thinking about putting windmills up at the moment and uh, it's quite shallow sea, was still an island uh, around about the beginning of that Neolithic period. So there's a lot of interesting archaeology and ancient DNA under the sea and that's where I'm going to start the things I want to tell you about today. So going back to where I started off, we have a site just off the south coast of England which was the land surface 8,000 years ago and today it's about 16 uh, metres underwater. Uh, and it's a place called Boulder Cliff, and it's just off the coast of the Isle of Wight there. So down about 16 or so, or so metres underwater, we have this, what we call a paleosol, uh, an 8,000-year-old soil that's being revealed by erosion. And what we can do with that is um, look at the sedimentary DNA, what's so-called sedder DNA, so the free DNA uh, in, in those sediments and basically build up a metagenomic picture of the past. But uh, it's an archaeological site, so I'm going to show you some pictures of archaeologists, underwater archaeologists, it's quite fun, um, and they dig along the seafloor, so this is them cutting into, uh, into Boldner Cliff itself. They bring the, 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 the paleosaur up onto a boat and quite naughtily expose it to all contaminants in the air. didn't happen with our ancient DNA, I promise you. Um, they find it's an interesting site for many reasons because the, the, stone, um, the stoneware is actually more similar to Europe than it is to the UK. Um, and it also has really interesting wood. Um, so it's, it looks like it was a boat building site. Uh, and that's interesting because it's about 2,000 years ahead of its time, which is a telling thing in the story I'm about to relay. So other interesting features of this site uh, that it has um, the earliest instances of fibre, uh, stone tools I've shown you, the shape of uh, northern France, and lots of this great worked wood. And this is a little picture of artist's impression of what life was like at those times. So, important here, they're building dugout canoes and they've all got ponytails. <laughs> and so, we, we, uh, we did our metagenomic study, which came out in Science a couple of months ago, and what we found was what we would expect to find. Um, so it's a very Mesolithic uh, uh, sort of profile. We found evidence of dogs, cows, not actually cows, those would be rocks at the time, which uh, if you're into your, your origins of cattle, you'll realize are about twice the size of a cow. It's a wonder that they ever got domesticated in the first place. But the curious thing that we found at this site was wheat, and we found um, lots of it partly because we're very good at finding wheat, because it's a huge genome and it's very well characterized, so any piece of wheat DNA that's left behind, we'd be able to um, fairly accurately identify. But the point is, it's 2,000 years earlier than agriculture being practiced on the UK mainland. So somehow, wheat has gotten to this hunter-gatherer site, this Mesolithic site, and agriculture basically comes from, as I'm sure you're aware, the Near East, and it spreads into Europe through, through two principal routes. Um, and this is the one we're interested in here, the so-called cardial wear route, which are people that follow the coasts. They use boats. They sometimes move very quickly. 
And although we have these, these contours represent the sort of areas of where agriculture was at certain times, that's where the majority of uh, the, the fronts were. So the pioneers uh, are well ahead of that. And 8,000 years ago, you've got people basically made it to the west coast of France. So we have contact, and this is big news, big news in our understanding of how we change from a hunter-gatherer society to a farming society, because it's mostly been assumed in the past that there's no cultural contact between the two, and one basically replaces the other. So it's a very hot area uh, of debate at the moment in the scientific community, and so a similar a parallel debate is going on in terms of the, the, the genomic makeup of humans of Europe as well, which works, turns out to be sort of half and half of hunter-gatherer um, uh, Near Eastern origin people. But so we've got this, this social communication of some kind going between the two, which begs an obvious question, which gets me to somewhere about the beginning of my talk, which is about halfway through my allotted time, of why didn't the Mesolithic people start farming? They, for 2,000 years, they just didn't bother. They, 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 they knew about agriculture, so we assumed that they didn't know about agriculture before, but they knew about it. Why don't they start practicing? And there are two possible reasons that I can think of. One I'm not going to talk about, the fact that they didn't want to, and there are, there are good possible reasons, you can ask me about that afterwards if you like, or they couldn't, because we are still in a world that's warming up, and as plants are moving in this northerly latitude, um, they're having to adapt to changes in photoperiod, harsher winters, etc. And there's a very interesting pattern that we see in the archaeological record, uh, from guys at UCL that published recently, basically collected all the radiocarbon dates of the arrival uh, of agriculture. And what you find is that repeatedly, agriculture arrives at a new latitude and then shortly afterwards crashes. And it crashes for a long time, so a millennia or so. So although weed agriculture gets to the UK uh, by about 6,000 years ago, it actually it has massive crash and doesn't really make much of a resurgence until the Bronze Age. Uh, in terms of, of, of a lot of activity. So that sort of talks of uh, a, a community of plants that have been dragged across a selective gradient and perhaps dragged too quickly. Uh, so that begs the question, how, how quickly can crops uh, adapt? And if we go back to the actual origins of the domesticates, uh, when we look at the archaeological record, we have a couple of graphs here that are basically tracking the, the um, fixation of the loss of shattering um, trait in various different um, wheats, barley, and rice. And they all, they all tell the same story. Basically, it's going on very slowly for thousands and thousands of years when if you were to do a field experiment, you can, you can actually fix that trait in, in 20 generations, if, even if you're a fairly primitive farmer. So without actually knowing why, we can work out that uh, the selection coefficients that are involved in this are quite close to what you would see uh, for natural selection. So I've actually gotten to the point now where I'm, I'm barely believing in the concept of artificial selection at all. Uh, but what we have is an emergent picture where plants are actually adapting um, to the human environment. And I think that's quite a good way of, of thinking about it. And if one's going to understand uh, the genetic diversity um, from, from your sort of genomic level, analyses, you really need to use models to work out what your expectations are. And so this is another area that we actively um, work in to help us understand. And that's just one thing I really want to point out here is an individual base model that asks the question, how much selection can you have going on in an individual in terms of the number of genes, number of loci under selection, and what level, what strength of selection. So we've got, we've got three axes here. We've got a probability of extinction. So the, pop, the population, or sorry, probability of survival. Pops, the, the, if you're up at the top here, your population's going to survive. Okay, number of genes, strength of selection, fairly simple. And what you find is that actually there's a fairly uh, um, defined limit. Basically, you can just add a little bit more selection and the whole population will fall off a cliff. And the number of genes that you can have under selection, again, this is something I could talk about for hours, is, is surprisingly low. So you're in, you're in the window of 50 to 100 or so loci, and that strength has to be right down at the levels that you would associate with, with natural selection. So there is a real limit to the amount of selection you have going on, and what's very interesting is that is actually pretty close to the ballpark of the number of domestication syndrome loci that have been unearthed in um, 
uh, scans for, for selective sweeps in the genomes of our various crops. Okay, so I'm going to whiz over that one. So this is, this, yeah, I'm just going to whiz over that one. <laughs> so um, that leads me on to a nice example of a crop that has adapted to latitude. So when you, when you consider the cereals that have adapted, so our wheats and our barleys, their adaptations that we know about to latitude are generally, in my opinion, very ugly. Uh, so you have massive deletions, knocking out of VRN loci or PPD1 loci. They're, they're not nice um, gene network changes in regulation and stuff that I come to expect uh, from, from the influence of Jim and Vicky here. Uh, they're nasty, but uh, flax is different to the other crops that came out of the Near East. There's about half a dozen or so that make it up to the UK. In that, it's the one that actually has a wild distribution that naturally stretches up this far anyway. So most of our cereal crops in the wild, sorry, are restricted to this area down here. So we have a situation here where you've got local wild populations that are adapted to the latitudes that they're at. And theoretically, the domesticates could go and pick up the, the, um, those local adaptations as they move up through the latitudes. So um, I sent a, a PhD student of mine on a lovely month-long holiday picking wild varieties of flax uh, through Europe. And he also raided some museums in Herbaria and even managed to get samples out of the Vavilov Institute in Russia. He was Polish. I think that helped. And uh, we had a, basically a set of modern cultivars, wild flaxes, and historic flaxes that are um, late uh, 19th century, early, early 20th century. Uh, so before there was a great deal of, of movement around. So sorry, this is a little bit technical to show. But uh, one of the things we did was this genotype by sequencing approach. So rad sequencing we used. And what we have is wild flaxes over here and various cultivated forms of flaxes. So these are the fibre varieties, these are the oil varieties. And what we're looking for is differences between north and south. So we're looking for evidence that as the cultivated flaxes move north, stuff comes in from the wild. So I need to talk you through this a little bit. Um, what we see, just in the case of the fibre and not in the case of the oil, is a latitudinal structure. Okay, so they break up north-south. And if you take each of those rad loci, and you break up your flax groups to the nor northern and southern group and look to see what the FST difference, uh, the level of, of genetic differentiation between those populations. Basically, what you found for the majority of the genome is there's not much differentiation, except for a tiny, tiny fraction, which are wildly different. So that picture basically shows you gene flow hemorrhaging from the, the wild flaxes into the cultivated flaxes as they move north. So that was pretty, pretty interesting, and we were quite encouraged by that. So we started doing the, thing that we, the obvious thing that people would do, especially plant scientists. Uh, we looked at flowering um, time-associated genes. So we looked at a whole roster of them, and we settled on terminal flowering locus, uh, which in flax there is actually um, a large number of, of in paralogs, so it's duplicated within the, within the lineage, it looks like. And we found, we, we settled on these because they show phylogenetic structure between the north and the south. So this is what the colour coding on these wild flaxes refers to. Those are different allele types which are described in this phylogenetic network. Now upstairs here we have wild flaxes and downstairs on the network we have cultivated flaxes. So you should notice a couple of things. There is, there is some structure in, for this locus, not generally for, for other loci that we've looked at. Um, and we grew the plants, and it's, they are associated with different flowering times. When you look at the cultivated flaxes, you've basically got two groups. And we can call these sort of earlier flowers and later flowers. And basically what you see is that you go, as you go north, as the cultivated flaxes went north, they basically picked up this green allele, this group here, uh, which you see more concentrated in the north. Okay, so far so good. And if you break it up into the historic samples and the modern flaxes, that pattern comes through all the more strongly. And we can work out the selection coefficient involved in that. And again, if you look at the historic, this is a great example about how uh, the signature for selection, you never showed that to anybody else. Oh, okay. All right. 
I'll speed up. <laughs> Sorry, a little bicker. So if you look at the historic fluxes, you get, a, you get a stronger signal of selection that's sort of been washed away with subsequent movement of fluxes. And really interesting, I can still get my sort of headline point in, is that uh, this, is, this dark green is the fiber varieties. This is the allele that's associated with the north. You can see it's picked up as it goes up further north, but it's associated with light, later flower time, but much more neatly associated with um, improved fiber quality. So flax was used for oil and fiber as it, was, it was, as it was first domesticated, oil first probably, but we see this improvement as it's naturally adapting to latitude to um, fiber production, which speaks of the plants adapting to a human environment situation and actually it, it could well be the plant adaptation that's forcing the change in use. And you also see associated with improved fiber variety a shrinking in the seed size, which is not so good for oil. Um, and that comes through in the archaeological record. You see that exactly that in the Neolithic Swiss Lake dwellings. You have large seeded flax superseded by, by small seeded varieties, which we would infer were probably um, better for fiber. Okay, I shall tell you nothing about Kharzarebrum and move straight on to my acknowledgements, and I'll take any questions if you have them.